Well, this afternoon um, we are privileged to be speaking with Dr. Barry Taylor of the University of Chester for the Post Hall Meets York Seminars interview series. Okay, so what first drew you to archaeology and were you always interested in the paleo environment? See, I can't remember. Um, I, remember I remember choosing A levels and thinking I was to be an archaeologist, but I can't remember why. I don't know if it just sort of came to me as a whim. Um, and I didn't really have any sort of tradition of like going around old sites or anything like that, so I'm not quite sure where it came from. Um, but when I, I finished school, so I finished my A-levels, did really badly, uh, and I went to work at West Hesperton uh, in the summer, uh, done at Powson's Excavations, yeah. and it was amazing. It was such a good, it was such a really good fun. Uh, all the people there were brilliant. Um, it was a huge excavation, um, and the archaeology was just incredible. And after that, I was just, I was stuck, really. So, yeah, so I can't remember why. But uh, yeah, once I'd, once I'd started, that was it really, and I just carried on from there. And then the sort of paleo environment thing came on as you moved through? Yeah, that was almost an accident really. I was, um, when I was an undergrad at Durham, one of the university excavations was to work in the Vale of Pickering. Um, and I'd not organised my field work or anything. And I just heard that there was this, um, this slightly deranged man called Tim Shadler Hall, who was teaching everyone um, sort of a, a cult, um, sort of about English heritage and that side of archaeology. Um, and he had said at the end of a lecture that there was um, a space on the excavations that he's got running the Vale of Pickering. And so I just had to go because I didn't have my, my second year excavations lined up. Um, and I went there and I worked there, that was 1995 I think, and I think I've worked there pretty much every summer since. And I gradually got more involved with surveying and um, sort of augering and mapping the mm. Paleo Lake. And the more I got involved with, with the landscape sort of modelling side of things, the more I got interested in the sediments that I was recording and the environments. And it really, it sort of stemmed from, from that really. So again, I didn't really have a, it, it just sort of happened by accident. Yeah. Weirdly, I was interested in Anglo-Saxon settlements at the time, so. <laughs> well, if you're digging with Dominic, you're going to be on well, your exactly, own, yeah, to be fair, so. so. Right, so, given your extensive research into the paleo environment since that, those beginnings, um, to what extent do you think changes in the environment affect human behaviour? Well, it's, it, I suppose at one level it's huge, so like when the North Sea rose, mm. like everyone had to leave or, or, or drown. So yeah, you have those really huge levels of environmental change that people just have to, like, are just, they're, they're, their actions are determined by them. There's the more subtle changes in the environment that I think people can either adapt to or to some extent almost ignore. There's you know, the changes in early policy in woodland, people talk about them being these sort of massive changes in the way people use their landscape and I'm not quite so sure, I think these things could be quite gradual and maybe over long time scales like human behaviour might change but I think on quite on, on a human scale I don't think people would really notice much of a difference. Um, so you have the, you know, you have that sort of change in scale and sometimes with archaeology, particularly with early prehistory, because you're looking at such long periods, it's really easy to think like, oh yeah, this change would have had a massive effect on people's lives and to some extent I think it would be they wouldn't really notice. So there's the big events that would have that, yeah, an immediate impact. But sometimes I think when we look back, there are, there are changes that we think are, are really significant and major, mm. that in people's lifetimes, and even in sort of like their memories, mm. that, that going back several generations, it wouldn't really have much of an impact. I think the problem is, is that um, I have no problem with the fact that environmental change can drive changes in human behaviour, but it's, it's that old, the sort of 1960s and 70s ideas that it was the sole determinant in the way that human culture sort of developed. So this idea that human culture is always adaptive to environmental change, yeah. that's what we're more of a problem with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your co-director of the recent excavations at Star Car and Flixton, yep. uh, how have your discoveries there advanced our understanding of the British Mesolithic? Well, um, as Chantal Canella says, the way we think about Star Car always seems to both reflect and then impact upon the way we see the Mesolithic as a whole. So it's inevitable that some of the things we have, because Star Car is so different to everything else, and that's such a large body of data, it's always going to sort of drive changes in the Mesolithic. Really, in terms of um, the last few years, um, I think the site is, is the fact that the site is so big, the fact that we're getting structures at the site, and these really extensive timber trackways or platforms mm. are looking at having a site on a scale that we don't really think about early Mesolithic society operating on. So big groups of people all working together, really investing in 
particular locations in the landscape. So rather than this whole idea of people you know, just fleeting through the forest and just following migrating herds of animals, it looks like people are, yeah, they're there to stay, and they're there to stay over substantial periods of time. So it's an idea of the Mesolithic as not being this, this quite sort of simple and sort of like a basic period of time. This idea that these, these people are quite sophisticated. I mean, when we look at the, the carpentry, the the level of sophistication with the animal working, and also sort of the cultural beliefs that come out of the deposition of um, barbed antler points, objects made from bone and antler, and then more recently, the last few excavations, whole whole animal carcasses. It's clear that there's really sort of like um, what meaningful patterns of deposition. So a whole range of ways in which I think just making early Mesolithic society seem much more sophisticated than maybe we've seen before. Um, so would you say that the British Mesolithic was similar, similar to sort of vertebral models seen in excavations such as snap um, so And then if people of the Mesolithic were more sedentary than traditionally we thought, basically, do you think they would have moved seasonally within defined boundaries? And if there are defined boundaries, how are those being marked? In terms of the Scandinavian Mesolithic, there's always been this, this tendency to sort of see Star car within that model, mm. and I think Britain is noticeably different mm. in the way it works. Um, it's certainly not. We don't. Have, it's certainly very different to the to the Ertebol style sites, I think, which are yeah you know, they're, they're later, so there's the mm. developments over time as well. Um, in terms of sort of territoriality, it's re it's a really tricky issue. Um, personally, I, I with with the way we see Star car and its size, and also the number of other sites around the mm. lake. I'm not convinced that they move at all. Yes. I think they, I think they're staying, what they're staying put. They'll, they'll, they'll obviously move out into the landscape, mm. hunting, gathering, going, and getting other resources, meeting other people, mm. that sort of thing. Um, but I don't think that there's much. Season, I personally don't think that there's there's seasonal um, sort of movement, mm. and I think that comes from that tradition of looking at um, ethnographic parallels mm. and, and just putting that onto the Mesolithic wholesale. Um, I'm happy with the idea that people might move a bit. Mm. Um, in terms of territoriality, again, it's really tricky to see within material culture. There's no, it's hard to see the idea that you've got clearly defined territories. Mm. And without knowing more about Mesolithic population level, it's hard to say whether people are sort of static. But I do imagine that, I've always thought that there's people probably around the lake mm. who are people who live and sort of work and operate in that lake edge environment, going out in boats, thinking about how how skilled you have to be to manufacture and use boats, the knowledge that required to be able to navigate yourself around that landscape would be completely different to the knowledge required to move around on the North York Moors, for example, mm. where we know there's contemporary activity. So I would imagine there's people down in the lake looking up at the hills, talking about the weirdos on the hills, <laughs> and there's a group of people up on the hills looking down at the bog hoppers down yeah. in the bog and just like, uh, basically, you know, maybe meeting, uh, hopefully on a friendly basis, but you know, Maybe like a slight sort of just uh, miss not yeah you know, not fully appreciating yeah, appreciating the difference mm. between them based on the environments they're in. I think it's really because I've sort of that was a side thing. I've always sort of wondered why if you found a site like Star Car where basically all year round everything essentially comes to you, why you would then wander off? But that was just no exactly. <laughs> sort it's of just, that I, had. Yeah. I think it's just it's so ingrained in us that. Hunter gatherers move, yeah. and yeah, there's lots of examples of hunter gatherers that, that don't move. And usually, it's just because hunter gatherers have been pushed into really, you know, quite sort of marginal environments mm. by farming communities. Yeah. So, all our encounters with hunter gatherers are either you know, they're already been pushed into zones, or they're in the process of being yeah. you know, eliminated and exterminated. So, I think their, their actions are obviously usually changed because of that. Um, so, we've all seen the images of the famous. Fragments from Star Cow, um, which suggests it's a tenant relationship between humans and animals, or hunters and their prey. So, what prompted you to consider a similar relationship between people and plants? Jealousy. <laughs> um, it was, uh, yeah, just having to talk. I've got several friends who, like um, Ben Elliott, was it, yeah. who doing all the work with Adler, friends who are zoo archaeologists, um, my wife's uh, an osteologist looking at the Mesolithic, mm -hmm. and they all say these amazing sort of stories with with their material, and I just got these bags of half rotten plant material, um, and yeah, I would not say something more interesting too, <laughs> but it also it struck me because I was, it's, I was, I was, got into it I suppose, looking at the relationship between humans and their environment, 
um, and my PhD was partly based in the physical geography department, mm. where they're all just die-hard for socialists. Mm. So they're archaeologists, but they, they have hypotheses, they test them. Mm. And I started thinking more about um, start, yeah, what it's like to live in these environments, the skills and knowledge, but also um, I visited a lot of wetlands and it was just starting to look at the way that you, you know, the physical interactions, like moving through wetlands and what it was like. And my, my supervisor referred to these as my musings, um, and he, he thought they were quite interesting, but he didn't have any, any trouble with them. And then the more I started reading the ethnographies about animist groups and the interactions between humans and animals, um, I just kept coming up to reference with references about to, to references in the, in the texts that talked about similar relationships with with plants. And, and like I said in the talk the other week, my favourite one is that this evil shrub mm. that the Koyakon have that the yeah. Um, the archaeologist who, who was working with them, had, yeah, he didn't see because nobody would show it to him. And I just love the idea of an evil shrub. And yeah. um, the more I got into it, the more you saw that these uh, like animist groups, it's not just animals, it's it's everything that can be, be animal and part of the world. And so it's really just sort of pursuing it from, from that point of view, really. And now I'm, I'm working with um, a friend who's a, a, a zoo archaeologist, and we're looking at uh, the whole thing of plants, animals, humans, that are all just bound up in part of the world that people inhabit. So whether it's thinking about these things having agency, but also just thinking about the encounters people have with plants. I mean, it's really sort of physical, moving through a forest, moving through reed beds. And it's, yeah, they're, they're, they're quite sensuous and sort of visceral encounters, in the same way that encounters with animals are, are very sort of like physical. And so yeah, so it's really just sort of pursuing it that way. And starting to see the world as a, like everything that's forming part of the world that can live in. Um, so, can you give us a brief overview of the archaeological evidence you've discovered that supports your argument for plants having sort of special status, and how would you differentiate between good and bad plants? That's a mean question. <laughs> <laughs> People don't have these ideas with evidence. <laughs> um, it's think, thinking about. Um, so maybe sort of selective use of certain species, mm. where you can't necessarily see a, a technological or material reason for it. So I think in the Rhine Meuse Delta, there's differences in the wood that people are making fish traps out of, which mm. isn't to do with the availability of uh, local resources. Mm. Um, seems to be quite spatially distinct in different parts of that landscape. Um, and it looks as if that different people are choosing to use different types of wood. Again. There doesn't seem to be a, a technological or a material reason for that because different groups are choosing different species. Mm. So, and again, it's not about availability. So, so that would be an example. People starting to select species. Um, I suppose you would. It would be hard to see the bad plants because people would would avoid them potentially. Mm. So again, maybe think about species that people don't use in their in their that are available in their landscape. So the selective use of species is, I think, um, the most direct evidence we're going to have. Um, and one thing that's interesting about Star Car, for example, is that they're, they're not actually depositing wooden objects in these areas. So they're de halfed they're removing mm. the plant components of spears and arrows and things like that and axes. They're putting in the bits of animal remains, they're not putting in the plant components. So maybe that says something about the way that they have that their interactions with plants, that it's not, certainly there's, there's no need to deposit those objects in the same way as they are with animals. So there's obviously a difference in the way they perceive. Uh, animals and plants. It doesn't mean that the plants themselves aren't significant. Mm. But also, even when people, some of it, I suppose, is just thinking about ethnography, but also thinking about um, how we think about things. So the fact that people might use a certain plant because it has certain material properties might also be very bound up in the way they see that plant. So, you know, um, willow uh, having sort of like flexibility being useful for sort of certain types of uh, task might then build into ideas about the plant itself. So they might not be thinking, oh, we'll use willow because you know, it's the properties of its cell structure as such. They mm -hmm. might be thinking, oh, willow is the bendy tree that has some sort of tensile strength that is useful. And it's pain relief as well. Yeah. So elements in this one, I suppose, that's useful for more than one thing. Well, that's it, the, mesid the, the mes medicinal purposes of plants as well. I mean, that would have a huge like, the fact, the fact that uh, plants can heal. Mm. I and mean, that would be a really important way of thinking about the way people perceive these plants. But in terms of hard evidence, it's always going to be quite quite difficult, yeah. I think. And um, you've stated an interest, you mentioned ethnography as well there. Um, 
and you stated an interest in how modern day hunter gatherers perceive their environments and you do use ethnographic data from your research. How far do you think the study of hunter gatherer groups in the present day um, can aid our understanding of the past and how do you, or what safeguards do you use to ensure that the data you get is accurate? So that's a really good question because the whole reason we are so reliant, particularly in early prehistory, on ethnographic parallels, mm. whether it's overt or whether it's um, just implicit in our, in our work. Um, and it's all leads to the question as well of, of why only look at hunter gatherers. And this is a question when Peter Jordan was here a couple of years ago, we were talking to him. It's like, if you're doing research in the Mesolithic, do your ethnographic parallels have to come from? Mm. Um, hunter gatherer groups. Is there? Does that give it greater legitimacy? There's all sorts of questions about like why we choose our ethnographic parallel, why we choose one and not another. Because if you start saying, well, yeah, but why not choose something from a pastoralist group or a farming group? Mm. And then you start thinking, well, why not just look at the way that we behave? And in some ways, there's no reasons why you can't look at the way that we behave and interact with our world and use that to inform our understanding of the past. I suppose ultimately, everything we say is what to be backed up by archaeological data, not ethnographic mm. parallels. So we can use the ethnography to inform our understanding, we can use it as inspiration for thinking about how these societies work. Mm. But there's always a thing, even if you're looking at a, a, an historical account of a hunter-gatherer group who is you know, in every way identical to the Mesolithic, mm. um, you still have to remember that you've got 10, 11,000 years separating it, it's unlikely these cultures are going to be the same. Yeah. So I think as a source of inspiration it's fine, but yeah. ultimately what we say has to be grounded in archaeological data. Um, you have an interest in seafaring communities, and you mentioned mm. the rise of the North Sea earlier on. Um, do you think that the ability to navigate large stretches of water became more important in the Mesolithic era? And is there evidence for changing your relationship with the sea and sort of large bodies of water during that era? I don't know about a changing relationship. There's definitely a sort of a clear, strong relationship, particularly when you look at um, the west coast of Scotland and the Hebrides, and, and increasingly the work that's been doing, the discoveries on the Isle of Man as well. Right, they're, obviously these are, are maritime communities, just nipping between these islands. They're doing quite substantial sea crossings. I mean, there's even ideas now that Scotland is being colonised by groups who are coming from like sailing around the North Sea Plain, around the top of Scotland and coming into um, sort of the west into the Hebrides. Anyway, so like potentially quite dangerous stretches of water, presumably in dugout canoes, which mm. aren't the most stable of boats. Um, I think they're obviously just, yeah, they're incredible uh, uh, in terms of their sort of uh, seamanship, they're, they're, they're really sort of accomplished sailors. I don't know if there's really a changing relationship between the sea as a general development, but the work that, well certainly in terms of the North Sea, the way that that landscape changes, the way the sea rises, you have constantly sort of evolving uh, maritime technologies and skills as people got used to different currents, different depths of water and so on. Um, on the west coast of Scotland, um, Karen Wicks and Stephen Martin have published a paper where they've talked about the effects of the 8.2k event and potentially the Storica slide, mm. which in terms of using radiocarbon dates, modelled radiocarbon dates as a proxy for human population, there seems to be a massive collapse in population at the time of the 8.2k event, mm. possibly related as well to the Storica slide. Mm. And if you think about the effect that that would have on maritime communities, I mean, their point is that it essentially depopulates the west, yeah. the, the, the west coast of Scotland. So people's relationship to it there in the sea is certainly changing in response to these catastrophic events. So it doesn't necessarily sort of develop through the Mesolithic, but there are certainly going to be the, the way that both those environments are changing on both sides of Britain is going to have an effect on, on people's relationship with the sea. Um, we now have the technology and scientific techniques to recreate past landscapes and environments. Um, do you think there's anything missing from our scientific analysis of the past and what questions would you like answered? I think being able to model spatial, spatial patterns of vegetation, um, that's, that's the thing that's still missing. Um, and whether we'll ever get to a human scale sort of mapping of mm. vegetation, I don't know. Um, the, the limitations of things like pollen and macrofossils in terms of saying exactly what plants are growing in areas is always going to be quite tricky. Mm. Um, but then in some cases, in some ways, it doesn't really matter because these environments are so dynamic 
that small scale changes in vegetation be happening all the time. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter that we know that yeah, there's a copse of tree there opening here, but because that will be changing maybe within people's life lifetimes anyway. I think it would be nicer to know to, to more precisely um, the source area of things like pollen of different species to be able to map vegetation to a certain level and certainly refining our radiocarbon chronologies which we're already doing really with uh, Bayesian modelling getting much better chronological resolution of environmental change so those two things would be to, to develop our chronologies and the spatial patterning whether that will ever happen I don't know but they would be quite nice. Excellent. So finally if you could excavate to any archaeological site past or present which would it be and why? Can I cheat with this? Because um, really, what I'd really like to do, because um, what I do remember wanting to be before I wanted to be an archaeologist was an astronaut. Um, and uh, the only way I can see myself going to space is to become the most famous archaeologist in the world, and then for NASA to discover some ancient dead civilization on another planet. And they would then send for me, and I'd go and excavate it. So, uh, yeah, the moon, Mars, I'm not fussy, the moon of Jupiter, or does Jupiter have moons? Saturn has yes. moons. So, yeah, so we're yeah, out of the solar system, that would be even better. Um, so yeah, excavating a site on another planet, that'd be ace. So essentially you want to be Jean-Luc Picard, is that what you're saying? <laughs> that would be quite nice, yes. <laughs> the way my hair's going, I'm going to Well, final, final question. If you were today, today, if you were to spend the day with Indiana Jones, what three items would you take with you for your survival? Hmm. Three hip flasks, I think. All <laughs> 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 uh, feel, fair, feel different Scotch whiskies. Mm. Uh, yeah, just to go through the stress, I think. Excellent. Because I don't like snakes either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you very much for agreeing to the It's no been problem. brilliant. It's been really interesting. So thank you very much, Dr. Mountain. Cheers. Thank you very thank much. You.